for being here. In the spirit of thanksgiving, I want to thank those of you who have reached out and offered your support and gratitude for all that we are trying to do to keep our citizens informed and healthy. Thank you to those who have called or emailed with your concerns, support, and the stories you have shared about the impact of COVID-19 on your family. For the families that have not had to deal with positive cases and quarantine, you are becoming a very small part of this community. Today we are asking that our business community continue to partner with our citizens by abiding by CDC guidelines. We are asking our citizens to be a partner with our business so that our businesses can focus on being successful, keeping their employees healthy and employees hired. Your support of our local businesses is vital. Several businesses have had to close because too many of their employees have been exposed to the COVID-19. Our number one goal is to keep the community healthy, our hospital beds available for those in need of care. Our businesses focused on serving this community and keeping their businesses successful. Our citizens are the first line of defense in fighting COVID-19. Our healthcare workers should not have to be the last line of defense and they're certainly not the first line of defense. San Angelo has always been a community that joined hands together in support of each other and of those in need. We need to continue in that spirit. We must have compassion for the families and the healthcare workers. They have been devastated, not only by the hours required to take care of patients, but citizens have certainly been impacted by the mental and financial impact of COVID-19, let alone the deaths in their families. We must continue to have respect towards our fellow citizens, and we must take responsibility for being part of the solution instead of the problem. I'm going to review a few numbers from this week, and I think there's, they've got information to put up on the, the screens, and so it will be there. But let me just refresh um, you with, refresh some of the numbers from last week. Our positivity rate dropped from 24.6 to 17.5, so the good news is the positivity rate is going in the right direction. We had 169 fewer positive cases this week. And obviously, because of positivity rate dropping, it also means that we've had fewer people being tested. Our hospitalizations have maintained um, 80 people for the past, I think, three days. But remember, the hospitals have stayed at 80 because we've had eight people die. So that has lowered the hospitalization numbers. Each of us plays a part. We will say that over and over again. I know that you want all of us to be able to provide the solutions to solving it all, but it takes a community. It takes each citizen being a part, once again, of the solution and not the problem. We know Thanksgiving is coming up, and we know that many of you will want to enjoy that with families. But also remember that COVID-19 exists in families, in small social circles, in backyards, in living rooms, in schoolyards, and in playgrounds. It is with us. It does not look like it is letting go anytime soon. And what I want us to do is to continue to be somewhat of a bright spot out here in West Texas compared to our other surrounding communities of Abilene, Midland, Odessa, and El Paso. The numbers are a reflection of this community and how seriously this community reacts to and takes responsibility for holding the numbers down and keeping us in a healthy spot. I'm going to turn the meeting over to Judge Floyd and let him offer some comments. Thank you, Mayor. There's been a lot of information and a lot of communication within the last week since we had this last time. I'm standing here today and I'll have to say I'm cautiously optimistic, uh, much more than I was a week ago when we were here. And I'll kind of line that out. First off, I want to thank the mayor, Daniel Valenzuela, Teresa James, and Brian Groves, because back in March when we first met here, all of our community partners, the city offered up their website and their public information office to try to, to 
be able to post all information in one place to try to make it as transparent for the citizens and, and as easy to find. The latest example of that is the one-page uh, information that was posted a day or two ago that basically outlined what we had been saying since basically the middle of May. The mayors had uh, very little authority in enforcing things locally. Mine is 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 indicated as a little more, but in reality, very much restricted by the governor's orders about things. So with that said, and, and also we try to make it transparent, tracking this mythical 15% hospitalization rate numbers that I've been trying to say that's very directly related to me because of the request I've made to the Texas Alcohol and Beverage Commission under the governor's orders to allow bars to open and restaurants to go to 75%. We're trying to post a link to that where anybody can track that. Obviously, those numbers change daily, but there's two, uh, two numbers on there that are, that are vitally important to that. One of them is, is the number of hospital beds they say we have in Region K. The other one is the number of COVID patients. So it's not just Shannon systems, it's the rest of them around there. And I, I'm happy to say is if we report the 80 number that we're showing today and our hospital rooms that are available stay the same on that website, our five-day moving average ticks down below 15%. For the last five days, we've hovered right in there. So it gives me hope where at least uh, uh, the citizens are kind of controlling that. The next reason kind of for some hope is, for one, obviously, if you watched the governor's uh, press conference yesterday in Lubbock rolling out the the antigen therapy, I'm not even going to try to, uh, to butcher the name of whatever the Bamblin in or whatever it is, but there was pretty high confidence that this has the ability in a number of patients to keep them from being hospitalized, which um, really the hospital capacity has been the main focal point since March, since we started all of this, is to maintain the delivery of healthcare services within the community. It's even more crucial now because we're somewhat on an island by ourselves because of uh, what's going on really surrounding us all the way. We have seen increases, but many of the other areas, as Dr. Sony, uh, the regional health authority out of El Paso on a conference call said Wednesday, there's 45 counties in her region. She said, let me put it this way, other than Erion County and Loving County, all the rest of them are worry counties because of the trending. Well, that limits uh, calling in the Calvary if you need help, transferring patients if you get overloaded. So we've really become what San Angelo's been for decades is kind of an island on ourselves. But the, and the, the next thing I'm encouraged about is the number of calls I've received in the last week from businesses, sponsors, organizations, planning events, all even through our annual uh, Stock Show and Rodeo next spring trying to determine where we're gonna be. All of those are attempting attempting to put in the, the safest protocols they can and still have an event. I appreciate that. So I know there's a lot of interest. Of course, private businesses, a lot of people mix government organizations, city properties, outdoor events in the county, and businesses into one group. Businesses are a little bit different. They have a different uh, uh, method of doing business. All along it was said you're not going to go to jail for not wearing a mask, but you can certainly go to jail for, for violating a criminal trespass warning if a business gives you that to you. So that's been there since day one forever. A business has been able to do that. So businesses have a little more control of what we do. We are basically, uh, our guidelines are dictated by the state. Much less, uh, you see Colonel Nazario out th up there, you know, we, we all have a superior authority that we have to answer to. Ours is the state, and even within the county, we have the Office of Court Administration, we have jail commission standards, we have on and on and on, that are issuing guidelines that county is trying to, is to deliver service to. But I think the citizens are, are, can read the numbers the same as we are. I think they're making adjustments. That's all we can ask for. Uh, yesterday, they certainly uh, indicated that this medication may help in the interim until the vaccines start arriving. There's a lot of enthusiasm about the vaccines. 
Obviously, they will start with medical personnel and go down through a priority list. There's several of them are going to be delivered. Some of them are, are a, a super deep freeze that can only go into certain areas. So depending on your locale uh, is what type of those vaccines that will come. But hopefully the sooner the better. So that's the reason for my cautious optimism is that we see maybe some light at the end of the tunnel that we can get through this. Um, I say that with, the, I'll follow up with the same, uh, same message yesterday uh, that was in Lubbock from Dr. Hellerstadt and uh, Chief Kidd, uh, NIMS Kidd with the Texas Department of Emergency Management. We're not there yet, so the, the separation probably is the most important, your hand washing. The mask, obviously, if you have to get within six foot of someone, uh, is, is an added security. I, you know, forever study people have passed me about they do no good. There's another one that comes down from uh, someone else that says, yes, they do offer some help. But bottom line is Dr. Hellestat with the state says uh, they do some good. That's passed to Dr. Sony in El Paso, down to Dr. Veredas here locally. So that is part of the governor's plan. So anyway, I, it's really about all I have. I, you know, again, I have some cautious optimism in a way, uh, a little bit reluctant to put that out there, but I just have confidence in, uh, in the citizens here that they're looking at the same information that I have. And uh, they have family and friends and uh, fellow church members and workers here. And so uh, hopefully we can, uh, we can continue this trend. And uh, maybe if we can avoid the, the, the the further restrictions or at least possibly get a little bit of a waiver for a week or two to see if we've got this under control uh, is a possibility that we will certainly explore. Thank you, Mayor. Dr. Redis, would you like to come forward? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. I was just going to kind of give you a little update of what's going on as far as in our area locally and specifically at the Shannon campus uh, downtown. All last week we were overrun. I'd come to work and have 10 patients waiting for admission in the ER and leave work and have 18 patients waiting for admission to ER. When I left yesterday, it was down to eight. When I got at work yesterday, it was only three. Shannon's opened a lot of uh, more beds in the COVID unit and they're trying a novel approach with COVID. You know, up till now, we've been the one that's taking all the COVID patients throughout our area. Everybody in uh, trauma service area K was sending all their COVID patients to us. Uh, we were overwhelmed and really unable to handle that. So what they've started doing now is um, they've worked out a deal with a lot of the surrounding hospitals that we will back transfer low acuity COVID patients to them so that we could, take, we could accept their high acuity patients there at Shannon. So this gives us a chance that we could do what we're best at, taking care of the people that are really, really sick and, and uh, need our level of care. But the people that just need floor level care, we can send these back to the communities they came from and help decompress our main hospital. As Judge Floyd said, we've started giving uh, the monoclonal antibody Bam, 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 bad. Everybody calls it bam, bam, because nobody could say it. So we're, we're giving bam, bam now. Um, this uh, monoclonal antibody has been shown to decrease the need for hospitalizations if it's given to somebody very early in the course of their disease. It doesn't work, at least it doesn't appear to work, if you give it to somebody who's already hospitalized, because it, by that time they've already made enough of their own antibodies that doesn't seem to help. But if you give it to somebody early in the course, those antibodies can be enough to neutralize the viral particles and make it so that person doesn't get really sick and doesn't end up in the hospital. So we're really excited about this. We're anxious to see how well that goes. Uh, like Judge Floyd also mentioned, there are several vaccines that appear to be moving fairly rapidly along towards uh, approval, and we're expecting somewhere into this year versus January, we should be having a vaccine here in town, and we're really looking forward to that. Hi, John Tuff, San Angelo Standard Times. This question is for Judge Floyd. Can you brief the community on whether or not we will be seeing compliance officers in any of our businesses at this time? 
Well, uh, of course, I think the manner of which we're going to are approaching that, Dr. Veredis could answer more, but no. Uh, since last Friday, uh, we, we haven't needed any compliance officers because I have had plenty of people contacting my office telling us about violations, whether they're businesses or this and that. Um, and I'm sure the city has been getting the same. Uh, again, I, I will let, I believe there's a letter that Dr. Verrett is under his cover that if anybody visits them, they just give the, the sponsor, the owner of the business, a copy that reminds them of the guidelines at this point in time. So that, that is really the limit of, of what we were only going to do. Uh, I actually have not received any complaints about anything out in the county that would be something that I would ask the sheriff to do. Of course, there hasn't been many events out there during this course. I think there's some this weekend, possibly. But again, um, I, I can't speak from what the city has had, but I've seen a copy of a letter that's being delivered. And all it is is reminding them of the guidelines. And then from there, it will be in Dr. Veredis's hands, whatever occurs. All right, and as far as our rolling day average is concerned, I know on the on uh, the screen there, we, we have Region K highlighted. It says that our current hospital beds, I think somewhere around the 620s, and uh, the number of patients they're saying is, is I think, 92, if, I, if I'm seeing that from this distance. Do you know about where we are on our rolling day average? Well, and that's what I was saying. Right with those numbers, which were yesterday's results, and if you see over on the left, it says it will be uh, updated daily by 4 p.m. And you see the last time it was updated. So obviously there's a tremendous amount of information on that and a tremendous amount being fed into it daily. But that was what is a reference when you're looking at K is that our uh, total staffed hospital beds went from 540 to 623 overnight. If it wasn't for that, that what does it say as far as... Uh, Patients, it, 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 that would have blown our numbers way out. But, but as it is, we were just a tick over 15% for a four-day rolling average. If those beds stay the same and we report the 80 today that are the preliminary reports, then that will move us to about 14.7 or 14.8 for a five-day rolling average. So it, it's trending in the right direction. You know, the first... The last five days, it had been trending in the wrong direction. It kind of flattened out some. And of course, like the mayor said, we've had more deaths than what we need. So that's what we're monitoring. I can't, I have, I have some limited information about where all that comes from and who makes the decision of what's posted. But primarily, I'm limited to looking at that when they update it this afternoon. And then what I will know is what DHHS is looking at and at what point in time they may choose to contact Texas Alcohol and Beverage Commission, who will in turn contact me that we have exceeded that. But if we're reading that correctly and what I've been told how that's going to be calculated, uh, we're safe for a five-day average right now. Well, I think it was 556 for a long time. It went up to about 580. It moved to 575. Two or three days ago, it was 540. And then this morning, it was 623. I, I cannot answer that. I really do not know. Uh, again, it's just the data bank that the state's going to look, look at in terms of any contact that they make with me. But what I've been told as of Wednesday with, uh, with Dr. Sony out of El Paso, how they were going to calculate that. I think it's the same information I've tried to make as public as I can so the general public can track that. Uh, then, you know, bottom line is they can be a predictor. The whole reason I wanted people to know is so if the event we continue to track in a negative way in terms of, of our percentages, that uh, unfortunate bar owners and restaurant owners would at least have some advance notice and be able to track them to make whatever plans they can. Uh, if today's numbers hold, uh, it's a reason for my cautious optimism. Maybe we can just ride the wave right in here. And uh, I was made aware of an appeal situation uh, to that, or a waiver, if you would, for a period of time, maybe a week at a time. 
uh, but they indicated that all other indices would have to be very, very low for that occur. Uh, but if we basically can uh, flatten this situation, and hopefully maybe the uh, bam bam, as Dr. Verrett, uh, as far as that works for me, if that has an effect and we can flatten or reduce that hospitalization, then it really gives a, a better, you know, we're, we're still not through with it. We still have a lot of people that are affected because, uh, you know, we also have about 170 or 80 patients that are being treated at home uh, with hospital staff at times, nurses and things. So we have a lot of people and a lot of families affected. We've had several departments this week within the county have been affected because of uh, outbreaks within that staff. Our clerk's office uh, opened back up today. We had to disinfect that whole building. Um, uh, one of our justice of the peace offices are extremely limited staff right now. Uh, the court systems uh, made some adjustments because of the interaction out of the clerk's office. And that's just Tom Green County. Uh, obviously, council of governments uh, canceled. Uh, the meetings that we normally have on Wednesday because of an outbreak within staff there. You saw what the school district, the adjustments they made for the game tonight. Uh, you're, you're seeing those adjustments all over the place from various organizations and business and things. And so uh, they're, they're, they're reading the information and I think they're responding to it positively and hopefully that will lead to a flattening of this and we can remain at this posture and uh, if, the, if the community partners agree, if we're just close to the line, if we want to appeal as a waiver for a period of time to see where we're going, uh, I, I could support that. Any idea on how long such an appeal would take? No, no I don't know who evaluates it. Uh, I, I, could not, I would not believe somebody within TABC, I'm assuming probably somebody in the health services department is the one that's going to evaluate that. So. I wasn't given, I didn't even know it existed except for a phone call uh, Wednesday with TABC trying to find out some information about the process. Uh, again, to pass on, you know, I uh, shared with him what I was attempting to do is try to give some type of an indicator where uh, our business owners could see the same things they're looking at and I'm looking at. but. He didn't share much of it. I was even, a, it's not published anywhere that it's even available. Doesn't have any criteria, but this was just verbally that was given to me that there could be a, a waiver request if it was just kind of an anomaly that you went over during that period of time, but you're trending down, your positivity rates, all of the other indices were tracking good that, you know, that they could issue a waiver. So I know it's out there now. Uh, we'll just see what the, the numbers and the facts on the ground at that time are uh, before we would decide uh, what position we wanted to take on that. I have no desire for anybody to have to close down. I just want them to try to do business as appropriately as they can and as safely as they can so we can maintain that, this posture. Joe Hyde with San Angelo Live. How y'all doing? Um, I got a question about the vaccine as far as the delivery of a vaccine. I know there's two of them out there. Um, maybe Dr. Veritas can answer, can, can be responsive to these. Um, the biggest economic driver of this town is the rodeo in February. So how fast can we get this vaccine distributed and out there where it's having an impact and perhaps we can have a bigger rodeo than probably what they're planning right now? think we can do it that fast you don't think it's going to help at all it's going to help some but i don't think we'll be able to get everybody done that fast you don't want me lying to you right <laughs> <laughs> you know if, if we can get you know vaccine and the next month early part you'll we uh, january will be great but again it's going to go primarily i guess the first group will go to health care ems um kind of essential service people and then it'll be spread out to uh, higher risk individuals and go from there but Okay. February, I don't expect to see a big change by February because it takes a while to actually develop antibodies and stuff after you get the vaccine. So when do you think, if we were to start distributing to healthcare and first responders and things like that in, let's say, January, when do you think this light at the end of the tunnel that we're all seeing, right, this little glimmer of hope? Oh, I see a glimmer of hope, but it's not for February. I think, you know, maybe 
April, May, we should be doing significantly better. Okay. The, uh, the next question I have about the vaccine is, and this is probably for all the government, is there's a lot of people in this town. This is a very entrepreneurial town. We don't have a lot of corporations employing people unless you're in the Air Force or work for ASU. Uh, so there's a lot of people there in the middle without health insurance or with high deductibles. What kind of financing, what kind of plan do you have for paying for the, all those vaccines? Or, or are they going to start charging everyone for it? And how much would you have, you know, are there any, are there any plans on there to get this thing rapidly distributed? And so that, you know, the, the single dad who is a plumber makes 45 grand a year, you know, doesn't have to go fork out $500 to get his family in, uh, vaccinated. What's that? You don't I don't know the answer for that. I mean, okay. Yeah. And last one for Judge Floyd, I just want to clarify. The state of Texas is looking at the rolling seven-day average being under 15 percent. Over or under 15. So it's a rolling. So, so when we go under 15 percent, it doesn't reset anything. We're still, we're still vulnerable. Well, again, it's a seven-day rolling average. So okay. if you look at two days, seven days, if you look at seven days, we're over 13 percent because we, we right. went from a fairly low percentage up higher, basically when we lost hospital beds. So that, that rolling goes, goes over, and you just look at the last seven days. Okay. I was just using the last two or three days is to try to use as a predictor is if we stay on this course, you know, four or five days out is when we'll hit it if we stay on this trajectory. You know, okay. so there's a number of different ways to look at it. Can I comment on your question about the cost of the vaccine? Yes. I think there was um, uh, in Governor Abbott's presentation yesterday, I think he clarified a lot. In fact, I snickered that he finally admitted what us local governments were, were knowing that was happening. And if you, there was a two-tier distribution of those CARES funds that came down in April. And community cities over 500,000, it came directly from the federal government, blam, and they took off. Everybody else that went to the state was distributed through the state, and 20% is all they authorized uh, up to this point in time. And we're actually going through the process of filing uh, the audit on that of where that was gone that was supposed to have been in by the 15th of this month, and I think they actually extended it till the end of the month to get everybody in to audit to make sure those funds that are going. The rest of it was held by the state, and of course, the state's been out a tremendous amount of money with PPE. I don't know what it costs to send a 100-person team of nurses and doctors to El Paso for two weeks at a time, uh, to send mobile morgues and that sort of thing, but uh, obviously there's a great deal of state cost. And I think the probably part of the answer is to that, that some of that money was being held back for what was being predicted that we could have challenges going into the fall, which are manifesting themselves. And I'm hoping that the state has held back an, uh, enough money to take care of anybody's financial concern if they want a vaccine. Now, that's not coming from the governor's office. That's just reading through the tea leaves and some, some communications yesterday that's the first of what we have had. We have been kind of frustrated that the state was holding on to that money. But uh, I think it, we all knew the reason they were doing it, but that was expressed yesterday, and probably it's going to pay benefits as this plays out. And uh, one more question for Dr. Bredis. Uh, the nursing shortage, or they were, you know, Shannon came out and said they were looking for nurses. Can you uh, address health care worker uh, availability, HR uh, situation we are in right now? Uh, yeah, um, actually, Shannon did get several traveler nurses and nurses from the state, and that's what allowed them to open their COVID unit all the way up on the sixth floor, I think. And now we have capability between the sixth floor COVID unit and the intensive care unit, which has been converted to be completely COVID now, the regular intensive care unit. I think we could handle 91 patients there. And I don't think we're staffed for completely 91, but we're significantly better. I mean. All right, one thing is from a reader, all right? He wanted, he wanted to, to, uh, for you to tell us what kind of treatments are happening right now for COVID, because we talked about the, the new thing. What is that thing called? The Bam Bam. Bam, Bam. <laughs> so we have the Bam Bam, which is new. Yeah. 
How um, else are, there, are is Shannon or any hospital here treating COVID patients? Okay, uh, pretty much standard of care around the country is uh, if you have severe respiratory distress, you get decadron, dexamethasone, which is a steroid. Um, remdesivir is not living up to our hopes, and it doesn't appear to be worthwhile as far as uh, inpatient people. Um, everybody gets zinc. Everybody gets vitamin C, D, multivitamins. Uh, a lot of people need oxygen support. And so as it goes from varying from nasal oxygen up to face masks to BiPAP, and then the unfortunate few that end up on ventilators in intensive care. Um, and that's about it. You know, the, we've changed kind of how we handle a lot of these patients to people that only need supplemental nasal oxygen that we might have admitted three weeks ago. Now we're able to actually get oxygen brought to the emergency department and discharge them directly from the emergency department home with their oxygen. And that, again, you know, helps decompress the hospital. And, you know, if you're going to be miserable on oxygen, you know, you might as well be miserable at home. All right, since so you're a doctor, yeah. if you're at home or yeah. you're, you, haven't been, you haven't gotten the COVID yet, yeah. what vitamins are we supposed to take? I, 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 I tell you what I take. <laughs> All right, what, what do you I, take? I, I take zinc every day. I take vitamin C, vitamin D and multivitamins. I, okay. I do the gummy multivitamins and just chew a couple of them. It's kind of like a dessert. That's all I have. Thank you, sir. Further questions? With no further questions, thank you for being here today. And we, our next one will actually be on December the 3rd. We will not have a press conference next week with Thanksgiving being part of next week, so December the 3rd, which is a Thursday at 2 o'clock here in this same room. Have a great Thanksgiving, everybody, and thank you for being here.